think uh, with that introductory remark, I consider my uh, the sacred mission to Confucianize Stanford, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which uh, may be a mission impossible, but I think now with the help of uh, Francis Fukuyama, my good friend, there's a hope, some kind of a hope. And uh, today, actually, uh, I simply want to introduce uh, Professor Fukuyama. And he will give the opening statement about the challenges, especially the institutional challenges, concerning the imagined uh, Confucian democracy. And I will give a sh short response. He will talk for about 30 or 40 minutes, uh, responding about 10 or 15. Then uh, Professor Wang will chair a general discussion. I hope this is uh, basically exchange. Last time, last year, when we were together, and uh, Francis Fukuyama said he was very pleased to be relocated in, uh, <laughs> um, in California, especially Stanford, because there's no need for him to wear a tie. <laughs> when I was uh, in the East, every time I saw him, always with a tie, either with the Rand Corporation or with uh, the State Department, not to mention uh, you know, Johns Hopkins and so forth. But now I decided to wear a tie, and uh, he doesn't have to wear one. Uh, many people actually don't know that uh, Francis Fukuyama got his, PH, uh, got his BA in classics, classical studies at Cornell, and his uh, PhD uh, at Harvard in political science. But for quite some time, he was uh, very deeply involved with the practical side of uh, politics. He worked for Rand Corporation at least three times, so over a pretty long period of time. And he worked for the State Department. He was a very important uh, consultant. And many of us, of course, also do not know that he was deeply involved with Middle Eastern studies. Uh, according to one account, he actually is considered as a specialist in Middle Eastern affairs and as deputy director for European political military affairs. And in fact, uh, in 8182, uh, he was a member of the U.S. delegation to the Egyptian-Israeli talks on Palestinian autonomy. So that very deeply involved in that. And then uh, he uh, became interested in the much broader, uh, let's say, theoretical issues. Uh, you know, his book on the end of history really uh, was a very important landmark in uh, international relations, international politics. And I think he probably provoked uh, Sam Huntington to develop an idea of the clash of civilization, saying, wait, Francis, not just uh, the, the, the only way. We still have uh, some other cultures to worry about, such as Islamic culture, immediate threat, but also from the distance, uh, Confucian culture. But when I met uh, Francis many, many years ago, I already realized that his conception of politics was very broad, a cultural element is very, very important, uh, not only cultural matters. And by then, he had already been very deeply involved with uh, the Confucian discourse of East Asia. And so from the study of uh, democratization, focusing on a particular model, that's the uh, European model or American model, uh, he decided to study the origins of political order. So actually from pre-human times to the French Revolution. Uh, last time when I was here, in addition to Francis Fukuyama, I also had the good fortune of inviting Robert Bella to be one of my conver conversation partners. As you know, the, the great book that he did last year, published by Harvard University Press, is on human evolution from a paleon paleontological time to the actual age civilization. So they all began in a time immemorial about human order. And of course, uh, his second volume is going to be uh, a discussion of the contemporary scene. And in that process, he has become very deeply involved in understanding China, not just as uh, economic power, but as a political system, as a cultural universe, in this sense that uh, I find his work uh, stimulating, uh, challenging, and extremely informed. And we met uh, last time, actually in, uh, in, San Francisco, uh, in uh, Berkeley, and involved in a Sino-American dialogue on core values. 
But before then, he spent some time in, in China and uh, was very uh, well received and uh, developed many, many ideas. And so there are quite a number of uh, uh, Fukuyama study centers <laughs> around China. But he's uh, running a very important center here. I think the question that he would like to address, broadly defined, is governance. And so I think uh, he w he's going to tell me and, of course, all of us what are some of the major challenges that uh, uh, some of us uh, interested in imagining Confucian democracy will face. Then I will give a short response. Since we uh, didn't get a chance to talk before, so this is basically extemporaneous responses and then open up for discussion. Yeah, Francis. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Du. It's very nice to see you again and have this chance to continue, actually, what's been a discussion over, over the years in, in many ways. So uh, I really am not a, a China specialist by any means. Uh, uh, what I am is a, a, a comparativist, and uh, I want to try to talk about the evolution of Chinese political institutions with reference to uh, ideological doctrines like Confucianism, but put them in a broader uh, global context um, uh, as a way of getting a handle on how they may evolve in the, uh, in the future. Um, the book that uh, Professor Du referred to is The Origins of Political Order. This is a Chinese edition. It just came out. Oh. In fact, this, this is your, I'm going to give you this copy after our session. Uh, it just was published in China in, in October, and I had a very nice session at Beida um, then uh, introducing it. So this is all in the book if you want to read a more complete uh, version of it. There's actually six whole chapters on China, but it doesn't actually go past the Ming Dynasty. So um, you'll have to wait for volume two uh, to get my views on contemporary, on contemporary China. So let me just set the framework uh, very quickly. Uh, a modern liberal democracy of the sort that exists in the United States or the West or Japan or other places consists of three sets of institutions. One institution is the state. So the state is a monopoly of legitimate force uh, that concentrates power and enforces rules over a certain uh, territory. And a modern state is a state that does this on an impersonal basis. That is to say, you know, old patrimonial traditional states were basically the, the friends and family of the ruler. And, you know, you'd appoint your cousin or your nephew uh, as a, a general or the tax collector and your family would get rich. A modern state uh, has a, an administrative structure where people are recruited on the basis of merit uh, and it tries to treat citizens impersonally so that your relationship to the state doesn't depend on whether you know the ruler or not. It depends on uh, simply the fact of your uh, being a citizen. Uh, the second set of institutions has to do with law or the rule of law. Uh, the rule, you can, there's a term rule by law, which is simply the administrative commands of the executive, of the state. But a rule of law is a little bit different because the rule of law means that the law is an independent set of <coughs> norms uh, or legal uh, edicts that is binding on the state itself, including the most important, powerful people in the state, the emperor, the king, the president, prime minister. And if it's not binding on the most powerful political uh, uh, executive in, in, in the country, then it's not truly rule of law. It's rule by law, you know, just the commands of the king, but rule by law means the king is also subject to the same laws that other people are subject to. And that's an instrument of constraint. So the state concentrates power, the rule of law limits power. Uh, and then the third institution is accountability. Uh, in the modern world, we think of this as democratic accountability, meaning free and fair, multi-party uh, elections. I think the concept of accountability ought to be a little bit uh, broader than that. It ought to mean, does the ruling class or the rulers of the country uh, actually reflect the interests of the whole population in some sense, or are they just interested in their own benefit. And you've got many predatory states, uh, even predatory states in places like Nigeria that have, you know, supposedly democratic elections that, you know, basically the, the people running the state just want to get rich. They want to get enrich themselves and their families. And so 
the critical element, I think, of accountability is less procedural than whether the, uh, the, the government in some sense reflects the interests of the broader uh, community or has some sense of public interest that goes beyond the private interest of the rulers. That distinction between substantive accountability and formal or procedural accountability is very important in the case of China because I think you can argue that China developed um, a kind of moral accountability uh, but it never adopted the, you know, except in Taiwan, uh, never adopted the rules of uh, formal accountability. Right, so the state concentrates power, the rule of law and accountability both limit power. And I think there's a kind of miracle of modern politics in a liberal democracy when they work well that you have a kind of balance between on the one hand a state that is extremely powerful in its ability to shape society in order to regulate, in order to defend itself, uh, in order to keep the peace uh, on the one hand and these two other sets of institutions, law and accountability, that make sure that that power is used primarily in the interests of, uh, of, of the broad population. Uh, now, in my view, China uh, never historically received credit for the fact that they, they didn't invent the state. The state you know, arose in Mesopotamia and Egypt and Mexico, a lot of different places all around 6,000 BC or so. But in my view, China was the first uh, society to actually create a modern state in this specifically Weberian sense of being impersonal, bureaucratic, based on technocratic uh, criteria, uh, merit, uh, and so forth. And this happened, I think, with the consolidation of the Qin dynasty, which uh, was the first um, you know, single national dynasty in China, which came to power in 221 uh, BC. Now, there's a story that I tell in this book uh, about how that happened. I think it's exactly what happened in Europe about 1800 years later, which is the Chinese just fought 500 continuous years of warfare. And as a result of these pressures of military competition, they were forced uh, to shift uh, to a non-patrimonial form of government because if you're constantly appointing your cousin as the general in chief, you're going to lose a lot of battles. And so you begin to realize that you actually need to have competent generals and you need a taxation system which then means you need an administrative bureaucracy and all of the components of what we associate with a modern state were really created as a result of this kind of military pressure. So this is what happened in Europe uh, beginning in the 17th, 18th centuries with a high degree of military competition. Charles Tilley, the sociologist, has a famous theory about the state making war and war making the state and I think that same scenario played out uh, in China. However, uh, China did not have the other two institutions. Uh, and in fact, with regard to the rule of law, I think that China is actually the only great world civilization that never developed a true rule of law. So China had rule by law. So there's a Han code and a Tang code and a Ming code. Uh, all of these are administrative commands of the emperor where, you know, the bureaucracy and, and, and the government says you must do, and actually they're mostly stated in terms of very severe punishments like slicing off your nose or something if you stole a loaf of bread or something. Uh, so they had laws like this, but they were not laws that, that uh, were constraints on the sovereignty of the emperor or the government uh, uh, itself. Um, and I think this is quite different from Hinduism, from Judaism, from Christianity, and from Islam. In all four of those other traditions, you had a legal establishment built around a body of religious law that did not emanate from politics. Basically, these religious laws had an independent existence. They were interpreted and they were administered by a separate religious hierarchy that had its own institutional coherence and, um, and therefore could act as a constraint on the state. And the clearest uh, and most powerful case of this was the Catholic Church in Europe. So the Catholic Church was highly organized. It was centralized as if it were a state itself. It actually, at various points, organized armies and actually fought you know, emperors and, and, and kings. Uh, but its moral authority was really what was important uh, because kings felt that they needed legitimacy from the Catholic Church. But this is also true in India. So the Brahmin... Um, uh, 
what, what's called a varna. The, the, there's four major classes. The, var, the varna of Brahmins is higher than the varna of Kshatriyas, who are the warriors. And in, uh, you know, under the rules of Hinduism, it is absolutely clear that political power is subordinate to religious authority. And so a raja or a king has to get sanctification from a Brahmin before he can assume um, uh, his duties. And uh, I think in India, you get very large legalist. I mean, the Brahmins are basically priests who administer uh, the law. And part of the weakness of political uh, entities classically in India is that's one of the important sources of it. But the same thing in ancient Israel, where you had um, you know, a group of judges interpreting the Torah. Uh, in, in the West, we've talked about the, Catholic, the role of the Catholic Church. And in Islam, you've got the whole establishment of the scholars or the ulama, who are the guardians of Sharia law. And in many circumstances, the caliph was different from the sultan. I mean, sometimes they got unified in the early caliphs and then under the Ottomans. But in you know, Egypt, for many centuries, the caliph and the sultan were different people. So law uh, served as a constraint. Uh, and China is the only world civilization that does not have a body, an independent body of religious law, codified religious law, presided over by an independent uh, religious institution. So in ancient China, you had basically emperor worship. But emperor worship is really different. It's not a transcendental religion. Uh, it, it's, you know, and, and nobody has an obligation to worship the emperor's ancestors if they're not your ancestors. Right? I mean, that's the nature of ancestor worship. And so China, not having a transcendental religion, never developed, I think, this kind of institution. And I think Taoism and, and, and Buddhism, which play big roles in Chinese uh, history, uh, entered China from the outside. And in a certain sense, you know, Buddhism got very strong in the Tang Dynasty, but it was always a kind of protest religion, or it was born by outsiders, and it was used in a way to mobilize you know, people against the dominant Confucian uh, orthodoxy. And for that reason, by the time you get to the Song Dynasty, they expel it, and you know, they restore you know, the premacy of, of Confucian ideology. Uh, and that continues up to the present day. So <laughs> Chinese Communist Party doesn't like Falun Gong. They don't like Christians. They don't like, I mean, they really don't like any other organized uh, source of authority that gives legitimacy to social groups that stand outside of the, uh, outside of the, uh, outside of the government. Uh, <clears throat> so, so I think that if you look at China's historical pattern of political development and compare that to the West, it's really very different. And this is why, you know, I, I appreciate the importance of culture, uh, but I think that cultural differences can also be described as institutional differences in certain ways. And it's kind of hard to know which, what's the chicken and what's the egg, because once you get a set of institutions in place, it sets a historical pattern, and then that's the way that people think and act, and it's passed down in, in cultural terms, and vice versa. I mean, the you know, cultural values also make certain institutions uh, more um, uh, uh, easier to implement and, and, and so forth. So the Chinese pattern of development begins with the state and it kind of ends there. That the Chinese get a modern state very, very early on in their history. And because they've got this extremely powerful centralized institution, they're then mm -hmm. able to control the emergence of other social actors which could challenge the primacy of the state. So in China, in contrast to Europe, you didn't really have a blood aristocracy living in its own castles with its own you know, territorial jurisdictions. You didn't have a commercial bourgeoisie. You didn't have organized uh, religious groups, certainly nothing comparable to the Catholic Church in terms of uh, external uh, authority. Uh, and as a result, up until the 20th century, uh, you have an extremely strong state and a relatively weak civil society, uh, or a civil society that's actually kept weak because the strong state you know, simply heads off any organization. And in fact, um, one of my graduate students was telling me that some, uh, someone at Harvard just did this study of all the Weibo communications. You know, it, it was actually kind of brilliant design of a study because they, they downloaded all of them in the first like 
10 minutes after they were posted. And then the sensors got to them and they were taken down. And so the study was to see what it was that the sensors were worried about and, and were trying to uh, filter out. And it turns out that, you know, according to the study, it's not opposition to the regime per se or ideologically incorrect things. It's anything that could facilitate collective action you know, on any basis. And so what the state doesn't want is anyone organizing around any other purpose other than, you know, like building a business or something that's clearly non-political. But, you know, they, they don't want other social actors out there that could challenge, um, uh, challenge their uh, authority. The pattern of development in Europe was very, very different. Uh, most people, I think, recognize that the state preceded democracy but what I don't think people appreciate is the degree to which law preceded the state. Uh, law was very well established in the Western tradition really, you know, by the end of the Middle Ages. And in fact, most of the people that ran, you know, the church, the Catholic church, the people that oversaw the Holy Roman Emperor, the chanceries in all of the major European countries, they're all staffed by lawyers. And the fact that you've got law, law so deeply embedded, you know, feudal law, ecclesiastical law, commercial law, law of various sorts, meant that when European monarchs wanted to behave like Chinese monarchs and build centralized, bureaucratic, very powerful states, they had much harder time doing it because you had these legal constraints. And so one of the reasons that Germany doesn't get unified up until the, you know, the second half of the 19th century is that Holy Roman Emperor or is constrained by all of these laws and they actually have to litigate in Regensburg at the, at the Diet of the Empire, you know, when any, anyone wants to, you know, try to consolidate some of these territorial jurisdictions and so forth. And Chinese didn't have to worry about this, uh, you know, because of this lack of, of transcendental uh, law. Uh, now, this is where the Confucianism comes in. Uh, so China does not have formal law embodied in a formal legal institution that is outside of the state. Uh, the functional equivalent of law, however, I believe is Confucian ideology. So, and, and by the way, this, you know, talk about difference in cultural value, but this is not, this is not foreign in the Western tradition either. This idea that you achieve constraint and good governance in, in, in the way that people exercise power as a result of moral education as opposed to formal procedures that, you know, protect you against uh, state power. So if you read uh, Plato's Republic, which, in which Socrates is trying to create a just uh, city in speech, the whole discussion is about the education of the guardian class that's going to rule this uh, um, society or this city and he says pretty explicitly that, you know, uh, procedures by themselves are really not sufficient if you don't have good leaders. And so the whole, you know, in book five, the communism of women and children and the education of the guardian class, this is actually very Confucian in the sense that the whole idea is you, you educate the prince uh, to certain uh, values and perceptions to make him a good uh, ruler. And that's what guarantees the you against the abuse uh, of, of um, uh, power and authority. And, and actually, it's not even fair to say that there's no institutional embodiment of that because the embodiment is really the bureaucracy. And it's the bureaucracy that constrains the emperor and keeps power and from being exercised in a totally arbitrary way. Again, there are a lot of Western parallels to this. So the Reichstag, the German Reichstag, there was a Prussian Reichstag that emerged in the 17th, 18th centuries was under a similarly absolutist political system, but because the German emperor had to rule through law, the, the bureaucracy that made the law became a kind of check on the emperor's powers. So the emperor couldn't just decide to violate the rights of a citizen because the bureaucracy would say, no, that's illegal. You can't, you, you know, you can't do that. Uh, and similarly, there's a, that book by Ray Wong on 1787, uh, 1587, A Year of No Consequence. That's a beautiful book because he actually <laughs> describes this one emperor uh, in the Ming Dynasty who actually said, well, I'm the emperor and I should be able to raise an army and go invade somebody. And he actually runs out of you know, the capital and tries to raise this army and the bureaucracy goes and gets him and brings him back you know, to Beijing and says, no, no, you can't do that. 
that's completely, you know, <laughs> that's not allowed by the rules and so forth. And so, you know, in a sense, although theoretically the emperor is, is, is totally sovereign and absolute, in fact, in practice, uh, uh, he's actually highly constrained by ritual, by tradition, by, uh, you know, by Confucian morality. Now, I believe that this has a very important modern implication because, in my view, this Confucian cultural area in the world, which includes Japan, uh, Korea, um, you know, Singapore, I mean, all the Chinese, uh, heavily Chinese-influenced uh, parts of East Asia, these are the only parts of the world in which you consistently have had uh, you know, a, a substantial number of what are called developmental states or modernizing authoritarian states, meaning that you've got, you know, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, uh, Park Chung Yee in Korea, the Meiji oligarchs in the late 19th century in Japan. All of these run authoritarian political systems, but they have a concept of the public good that you just don't get in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, you get an individual minister that steals, you know, 20% of the total country's education budget and puts it in a bank account in Switzerland. And, you know, although there's corruption in <laughs> East Asia, uh, you know, it's just very hard to imagine, you know, similar kind of behavior on the part of uh, officials in a Confucian uh, society. And so that's the reason I think that the, you know, the values uh, are actually uh, extremely uh, important. There's other values that are critical. I mean, education. So, for example, uh, you know, in, in Confucian, traditional Confucian society, since education is the only route to upward social mobility, uh, you know, it just gave everybody a big incentive to educate. You know, if they had a bright kid, they send them to school and get them educated. And, you, you know, the whole village would profit if he actually got into the bureaucracy. And so, that's my view of where the Chinese, the contemporary Chinese tiger mother comes from. Is it's kind of you know so back then it was all for the sake of political power. Today you know you can get into Stanford and then do a startup and make a billion bucks. You know, uh, mm -hmm. but but the cultural you know the cultural uh, um, tendency is uh, still there. There's other issues I think that are also still quite relevant out of that tradition. The one that I've been thinking about uh, a lot recently, the, um, the fight between the Confucians and the legalists actually has a very contemporary uh, counterpart in a discretion that takes place among lawyers about rules versus discretion. Because basically, you know, the legalists said, look, you have to have a lot of rules. People are not going to know what to do if you don't make it very clear. You can't do this. You can't do that. There's not going to be any uh, uh, order in society, and, and you got to make them explicit. And the Confucians said, you know, they made a very reasonable argument. They said, you know, there's no rule that's good in all circumstances. And when you apply, uh, when you write down, when you even write down a rule, you're already constraining uh, uh, the situation in a way that does not take account of context. You know, it doesn't take care account of the parties to a conflict. It doesn't take account of the whole situation. And what you need is someone with very good judgment to look at this situation and all of its detail and then come up with a just solution. And you simply cannot codify what this, the just outcome uh, is going to be. And in administrative law, you know, we actually have very similar kinds of uh, uh, disputes because, you know, one of the things that drives people crazy about modern bureaucracy is that the bureaucrats just have these stupid rules and they apply the rules stupidly and they don't apply to particular circumstances and so then you want to say well you got to give the bureaucrats more discretion but then how do you guarantee that this discretion won't be misused and 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 so forth and so in a sense that particular fight you know from <laughs> from the um spring and autumn period has really not been resolved i think in in uh, contemporary legal life so just to end up uh I think that I think that this, the the social context in which these institutions exist now is really really different uh, because of industrialization and economic growth. So the Chinese could maintain this state-centered 
weak society system for 2,500 years uh, because it's an agrarian society for that entire period of time. But the moment that you start to industrialize and you have a market economy and you have rapid economic growth, uh, all bets are off because all of a sudden now you've got you know, a middle class, you've got commercial interest, you've got big companies, you've got lots of international uh, connections as a result of globalization. And although the Chinese government would like to control you know, the formation of potentially hostile groups, it's really hard to do that in a modern you know, capitalist economy. Uh, and as people get better educated, you know, they have different values. I mean, so this is one of the, in fact, I've had several arguments in China about this because a lot of the China model people will say, well, there's just a you know, clash of values here and we respect authority, and no individualism, blah, blah, blah. And I actually sort of think that if you look around the world, yes, of course, there are these deep you know, value differences, but people also evolve as a result of the modernization process itself. So as you become wealthier, as you develop, uh, and, and particularly as you become more educated, your willingness to just follow <coughs> authority, I think, declines. And I think you can see this pattern happening in a lot of different societies, and not just in the West. Or not, um, and, and you see this, I think, uh, you know, going on uh, in China. And I think one of the interesting questions will be, as China continues to modernize economically, to what extent will this state-centric political system continue to exist, or will it actually begin to increasingly resemble uh, what I regard as a more balanced system? And by the way, I don't want to sound like I'm too <laughs> much a cheerleader for our American Western system, because what I'm arguing in the second volume of this book is actually we're unbalanced in the opposite way. We have too much law, and we have too much democracy in certain respects, and we've got a very weak state, and we actually need to rebalance that, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways. But uh, I think, the, you know, one of the big questions for the China in the future is will formal rules, uh, rule-based decision-making, as we political scientists say, is that going to expand? It's already expanded tremendously since 1978. Is that going to expand? And is, it, is the level of it going to go up where it actually affects the behavior of, you know, senior members of the, the Chinese Communist Party? Uh, democracy, I think, is probably further in the future, but that's the consequence of this kind of social mobilization, is that when you get, you know, wealthy, educated people that are connected to the outside world and, you know, they've learned to think for themselves, then, you know, this kind of old traditional authoritarian system, I just think, becomes uh, harder to maintain. So that's it. I will sit down and listen for your comments. Thank you. Well, fascinating talk. I think I will begin with uh, the two uh, major issues or difficulties you mentioned. One is rule of law. Uh, the other one is uh, democratic accountability. And I think I would take the whole question about ritual or Li very seriously. Uh, not simply as ritual, but as Li. Mm -hmm. And I think normally we have this distinction between Li and Fa. Fa actually refers to law. But I think as many people have pointed out, the Chinese conception of Li flows beyond uh, ritual, no matter how broadly you define it. And a very large portion of it is actually the, uh, the British idea of, of customary law. So the question of discretionary right is very important. I would take uh, uh, the essay by, actually the dissertation, by Han Jie Pong, Han, Han Cha Hak, seriously. This was done as a dissertation to the Harvard Law School and entitled Confucianism as Constitutionalism. So you, we need to talk about uh, a regulatory system, which is a which is a system that is designed deliberately to control power, especially those who are powerful. So his argument, you know, Han came from a, a very noted uh, uh, family of outstanding scholars here, jurisprudence from Korea. So this example is from Korea, but 
it's uh, quite compatible with the situation in China. What he argues is that the ritual system, or the Li, Li is a better, the Li system works in such a way that not only the idea of the, the sovereign, who's not just, um, uh, who's, who's the only person who has formal freedom, as uh, Hegel pointed out, is the least free of all agents within the bureaucratic structure because there's only public persona. There's no way you can imagine an emperor as a private person because at every juncture, let's start with the apparent. And normally three major teachers will be involved in educating the heir apparent. So when you become emperor, and uh, you'll be, uh, everything you do will be recorded. Uh, one historian will take care of your words, any, any word you utter. The other one will take care of your behavior. So your ordinary life, even in, in terms of your sex life, is everything is public record. So the constraint is such, it's quite understandable that throughout Chinese history, uh, there are numerous emperors. Some of the emperors are very good, some are very bad. But it's very difficult to find and a really tyrannical emperors like, like uh, uh, Yvonne the Terrible or some of the French kings, you know, considered uh, the kings as the embodiment um, of, the, um, of uh, God's will. So the Chinese emperors in general behave in terms of normal pattern. So that kind of constraint, regulatory constraint. That regulatory constraint is not only in terms of power, but in terms of the bureaucratic structure. So it's a, it's a constraint which is, of course, not rule of law, but at the same time, it is so, so much internalized, and it becomes absolutely critical. Now, in this connection, I think it's important for us to remember, if you look at Chinese history, the collapse of the Han is comparable to the collapse of the, um, of the Roman Empire which, uh, of course, didn't lead China into some kind of feudalism, because then the rise of Tang, and then later you have uh, dynasties like Song Yuan Ming. So how do you understand these kind of dynasties? The, the phenomena of the, uh, of the Holy Roman Empire, which is uh, not holy, uh, not Roman, and not an empire, <laughs> and was a kind of authority, we call it either moral or religious authority, it's paired by comparison with the, uh, the rise of the Tang and the Song and Ming. In other words, the model that developed in the, uh, in the Qing has been so much transformed, I would say Confucianized, uh, in the Han. So you really have a very different model. It's not a model that grew out of familiar competition. It's a model that became, if you use Weberian idea, it's the total routinization of charisma. So that became, became part of the game. So that, that, uh, that bureaucracy is no longer simply a function of the state. It has also, well, in the case, a moral or religious uh, power. So, so in, in that sense, not the rule of law, but certain kind of uh, symbolic control, I think very much in the tradition of Bourdieu and others, this symbolic control turned out to be as powerful as Christendom, uh, as uh, religious sanctions. Uh, then the question about society. It's uh, fascinating because yesterday I tried to use Edward Shear's notion that Confucius could be considered as a major intellectual resource for the modern idea of civility or civil society because in terms of education, uh, in terms of uh, not, a, not only uh, upward social mobility, uh, but also in terms of this whole uh, conception of politics. Uh, not simply in the bureaucratic sense, <clears throat> but also in the ethical religious sense. Then the question about the absence of uh, the transcendent uh, religion, which I think was a deliberate choice by Confucius. Um, in other words, the, the idea is I am a human being about other human beings. I cannot hurt with birds and beasts. So the ultimate value of life, of the world, is not located somewhere else. It is here to be realized. So you have something, we call it uh, imminent transcendence. It's not radical transcendence. Now Weber would consider imminent transcendence uh, as something which may not generate enough transformative power because you need to have a kind of Protestant notion of um, God, which is totally outside of the world, which can shape the world according to a transcending vision. 
But the imminent transcendence is related to the Confucian idea of Tian heaven. But that idea of Tian is uh, related to a utopian vision of what the society ought to be. In other words, the tension is not between the transcendent and eminent. It's between the ideal and the practical. And the ideal can be a very, very uh, uh, compelling. When you say utopia, normally it's in the future, and normally it's nowhere. You know, the idea of utopia, nowhere, they can never be realized. But when you have this notion about something that had already developed in the, in the period of the sage king, the argument is to say you have no excuse not to do it because it had already been implemented. Well, that's maybe an ideal, but the ideal uh, generates uh, a, a lot of, uh, let's say, persuasive power. Now, in this connection, I simply also want to note a difference can be made between private and personal. Uh, normally, we discuss the difference between private and public. And if uh, something that is personal is considered private. But I want you to take into consideration of a, a kind of philosophical way of looking at it. Something is profoundly personal, but it's not private. It is uh, publicly accountable. It is discussable, debatable, and falsifiable. So this experiential involvement in the process, which means, of course, uh, laden with ethical religious implications, is not simply a private matter. So you can have a, a, a form of argument uh, in the society which is uh, based upon sheer ideas, or you say maybe, maybe under the influence of ideology, sheer ideas, and that um, ought to be developed not only in reference to uh, the bureaucratic structure the, as it presents itself, but in terms of everyday, of li uh, everyday life. Uh, in other words, a literatus or a scholar official may be able to tap at least four or five different kinds of resources in order to develop its own legitimacy. First of all, it's the philosophy of self-cultivation, which is uh, related to, I think, the religious idea. Unless you cultivate yourself to become a good person, it's difficult for you to become a leader. But that's only part of the story. The second one is um, it's not a democratic in the modern sense of the term. It is related to a populist notion that what you do, the action will have to be accountable to bring well-being for the overwhelming majority of the society. So there's always the idea, heaven sees as the people see, and heaven hears as the people hear. So the mandate of heaven is, ref is reflected in the acceptance uh, of the people. And the third one is a, historic, is a historical uh, argument that what I do here now is not simply something created, it is something rooted in historical consciousness. You know, in, the, in the philosophical sense, Manchus would say it's in Confucius, in Duke of Zhou, and so forth. But in Han, Han situation, it was actually uh, in the Eastern Zhou and even before, or in the Tang Dynasty, they say it's in the Han. So the historical weight is very powerful. Then there's also a transcendent reference. Uh, heaven is not uh, uh, om uh, omnipotent, but heaven is omniscient and uh, omnipresent. So we have a sense of heaven. Uh, later, of course, that's ten, but also have the idea of deep. But you have a sense of transcendent reference, which is um, uh, deeply rooted in the common experience here now. Finally, there's also a futuristic demand. That is what you do as a rule or law will have to be able to work not only for our generation, but for numerous generations to come. So you have a very different conception of what uh, a political action ought to be. So in, in this particular context, and I would say with the view, let's say with the view to the future, the Basic enlightenment values, as I stated yesterday, all the basic enlightenment values, such as rationality, human rights, rule of law, uh, dignity of the individual, uh, freedom and rationality, all these will have to be, if not implemented, would uh, have to be taken absolutely seriously in the modernization of China today. In other words, there's no way China can, like some of the Confucian scholars in China saying, we have a different conception of human rights, or we have a different idea of law, we have a different 
understanding of democracy, all these kind of rhetorical devices to me are not very persuasive because the legal constraint, uh, especially the market economy without the legal system, it's not going to work. Uh, without the idea of human rights, it's very difficult to argue that uh, the responsible government uh, actually, actually supports the broader vision of human flourishing. There's no way. So my, my sense is that uh, all these uh, ideas that have been put into practice in um, industrialized societies in America will have to be taken absolutely seriously by the Chinese regime, and yet that's not enough. I think maybe related to your, your second book. What is happening in, in the Enlightenment uh, legacy is that <coughs> even we uh, manage to develop uh, the institutions, uh, the basic values embedded in the institutions, the numerous other uh, very important concerns that we have to be we have to be taken seriously. For example, the question of justice. So I think Sandel's notion about republicanism is important. The question about uh, sympathy or compassion. I don't know how you understand sympathy and compassion in a liberal democratic procedure, uh, especially if you're interest, interested in the procedural democracy without any kind of concern for the substantive values. And how do you introduce the notion about responsibility? Of, uh, of public accountability and, and so forth. So in this sense, I would say um, in the short run, maybe for the next, when I say short run, I mean next 10 years. And China will have to go through a process where the legal system, the idea of human rights, the basic features of democracy, including election, and uh, uh, even the possibility of, if not a multi-party system, at least within the party, they have radically different factions and so forth. They will have to share and compete. So uh, that aspect of democratization, or those aspects of democratization, will have to be taken seriously. But uh, China needs to develop a much broader vision about democratization or modernization, including questions of ecology question of uh, justice, a uh, question of re responsibility, and, and so forth. Only then will China be able to say, we have a dream, we have a vision, uh, which uh, in a way can be um, judged and critiqued according to the criteria that are already being accepted in the West. And at the same time, we have something other to offer, uh, which, which you may be shared by many of the communities outside the West, including Islamic, Hindu, and a lot of American countries. So unless you have uh, both a very realistic understanding what China needs, and also a broader vision uh, when, when the model works, uh, that it could even turn out to be a source of inspiration for others. Otherwise, it's very difficult to, to really uh, accomplish this uh, very difficult task. Should we sit up here? Okay, we'll okay. sit up there. All right. So um, I just have a question about, so just now both of you mentioned about the uh, uh, various institutional and uh, societal differences between traditional China and uh, Western states. So as a student of literature, I'm very interested in the emotional or aesthetic value that also played a role in traditional China. Um, because just now Professor Fukuyama mentioned that uh, Confucianists turn, uh, tend to reject uh, the rigidity of legal codes because they consider that um, uh, the rule of legal systems should be contingent. And if you read literature in traditional China, um, sometimes people would be excused for their violation of certain uh, legal codes if, say, um, they do this or that for the good of the family or if um, a woman um, participates in prosecution to save her mother in a diet. Uh, on the dying bed. So, um, which brings me to the question of um, emotional value, because nowadays China is, mm, is playing the idea of, of soft power and it seems like um, 
both the government and scholars want to draw the emotional resources, you know, to help st strengthen the tradition um, in our society. But that also seems to be a double-edged sword because um, some people criticize that this soft power has been uh, overloaded with the uh, communist ideology. So my question would be, like, in the modern society, how do we draw out the, the genuine emotional value of our tradition without uh, tainting it with uh, political ideology uh, to an extreme extent? extent. Well, why don't I begin and then... Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think uh, recently, Joe Nye visited uh, Beida and uh, talk about what he calls the emergence or the, the advent of Chinese uh, soft power. And he's quite optimistic about that. Uh, I think he may even be right. If you look at the Japanese situation, they, they use the term gili ningyo, in other words, yili, renqing. So the law, the legal constraint, is always connected with a kind of uh, emotive elements of discretionary uh, discretionary power of the um, of the judge. So the a, a part of the human condition is that there's always cognitive deficit and always uh, aff affective surplus. Our ability to know always falls short of our uh, emotive need uh, to know or to express. So that conflict is is great. That's the reason why politics in the Confucian tradition is considered renzi. You, you call it the humane or benevolent. The argument is that without that element of the human element, the feeling, that uh, the legal constraint can turn out to be not only legalistic, it can be litigious. And the human feeling will be sacrificed as a, as a result. And even the society may be orderly. The society is not at all good for human flourishing. Well, um, actually, I'm going to turn my response to you into a question for Professor Du, because this is something uh, I puzzle over a lot. Uh, I personally would like to see China recover this whole rich Confucian historical philosophical tradition. Uh, it is such a rich tradition, and I think that it was a total crime that, you know, under Mao, that whole th there, there's a complete rupture. Well, I mean, it started before Mao. So with the rise of liberalism and all these other doctrines in the 20th century, you know, the Chinese decided this is a worthless tradition. We're just going to try to get rid of it altogether. And, you know, but Mao um, really consolidated that. And, and there's a complete rupture. People weren't taught about this history uh, and, and so forth. And I think that's terrible, you know, that, that people ought to have connections with, especially when it's the Chinese tradition that is so... You know, it's so old, it's so rich, uh, it's so highly developed, you know, so it's, it's a terrible thing uh, to lose this. But I guess the, the th when you talk about the emotional content, uh, when you try to go back to that tradition, you've got this one big problem in China, which is the Communist Party and Marxist-Leninist ideology. So much as people would like to get back to their roots, the party just, you know, and, and you can see this hesitation on their part that, you know, they want to try to legitimate, and they, they kind of realize that people don't believe in, in communism anymore. They want an alternative source of legitimacy, but they can't just turn the clock back and, and go back to these, you know, authentic cultural roots. And so they end up, you know, just promoting materialism. And that's got real problems as well. And so I guess my question for you is, <laughs> how do you get past this obstacle? And, you know, because I support, you know, I'm glad you went back to, to Beijing. I'm glad, you know, you're trying to help uh, China recover this tradition. But how realistically, or just in practical terms, are you going to get past this, this obstacle? Mm. I want to avoid the question about personal commitment, because yeah. then you lead to all kinds of uh, psychological <laughs> speculations. But I think the broader issue is, tru is truly uh, significant. Let's say in America, no matter how you define liberal democracy in, term, in terms of procedural democracy or the political process. There's a huge arena in the everyday life of the Americans that have nothing to do with politics, nothing to do 
with the pursuit of democracy. That's the religious life, the ordinary life. You know, 70%, 77% of Americans still not only uh, believe in God, they're Christians. So it's a very, no, you know, some people have all c only weekend Christians and so forth, no matter what. It's still part of the, uh, of the ambience of the society. So in addition to politics, maybe no matter, no matter how, how much a person becomes a political animal, there's another huge arena in our uh, life world that is significant, meaningful, and so forth. But China, the Chinese society is so politicized in such a way that uh, the, the government is not satisfied by being simply a secular bureaucratic structure. The government is interested in not only politics, but ideology, morality, and so forth. So this is the, this is the big question. The, the one thing we can do, which whether we're successful or not, is to recover a very deep tradition uh, in, in Confucianism. That's that what I call the spirit of protest, critical spirit. In other words, the deliberate attempt not to be politicized in a very shallow way. Uh, when I went back to China for the first time, you know, I, I, I grew up there in uh, 78, then in 80, I asked myself, is it possible to imagine the emergence of um, a kind of intelligentsia, broadly defined intelligentsia in China, which is uh, relatively independent. In other words, there's an independent arena that we could call intelligentsia, not totally politicized. And my answer is, of course, yes. What you, what you see in China, the dynamism generated in the, last, in the last 40 years by some of the people who were party members, right? Uh, like Hu Yaobang, but it's a different kind of party member because he had a much broader vision about, about Chinese society. His understanding of uh, Tibet, his understanding of Chinese foreign relationships, his understanding of what politics ought to be is very different from Deng Xiaoping's. And yet he was, uh, he was very successful. There are many, many uh, such um, um, intellectuals in the government, in the mass media, in many other areas. So. I do believe the possibility of a different kind of discourse, which may even have institutional implications. To say we are uh, loyal members of this uh, community, you know, or almost like the uh, loyal opposition. But yeah, okay, but, but, but I guess my question though is, can you just incrementally, you know, move little by little in that direction, or doesn't there actually have to be a rupture, where at some point you just say yes, actually? Marxism-Leninism was a tr tremendous mistake, <laughs> uh, just like the Germans, you know, repudiated Hitler and, well, I mean, unfortunately, the Russians haven't completely repudiated Stalin, but but at least they made the, you know, the effort to do that. Uh, but until you actually make that really dramatic break, I, I just don't see how you kind of creep up on <laughs> the recovery of this tradition, you know, uh, if you still have to endorse the you know, the whole communist narrative of the 20th century. No. I, I think um, more or less in this area, I'm optimistic. Uh, I think my optimism is not based upon the uh, sudden rapture, because it's already been done. What is happening in China now is, first of all, it's pluralistic. And the rhetoric of uh, official communism, based upon uh, Stalin, uh, based upon the Mao, Lenin, uh, no, I mean uh, Marx, Lenin, Mao. That's corrupt. Everybody knows it's irrelevant. The big problem is uh, the uh, the legitimacy of uh, the not the legitimacy, the statue of Mao. That's that's why I was so offended by the new lefts. You know, the new lefts. Many of them are really very brilliant, and they really believe there's something something about Mao. You know, for for. Uh, someone like Deng Xiaoping or even for uh, Xi Jinping, Mao is absolutely critical for the legitimacy of uh, the Chinese Communist Party. But for the overwhelming majority of the scholars and intellectuals, not necessarily. Demoralization to me is absolutely necessary, which may lead to a rupture. The rupture is suddenly the portrait of Mao disappears. I think it has to be done somehow. S the symbolism of Mao is now considered a negative example. 
what Cultural Revolution did, what Mao did, and following Marx is different because Marx is complex. And uh, you know, the, the Habermas is also Marxist in that sense, so that's all right. But Mao is, the, to me, is a major problem. That may be, may be uh, the, the rupture uh, will happen. You yeah. know, when, when the Confucius statue showed up in Tiananmen, <laughs> and uh, I got so many calls. You know, people say, you must, be, you must be very pleased. I said, no, no, no. Don't ask me any of those questions. I don't know the background. So many Confucian scholars, actually some of them publish articles and say, look, this is the right thing to do. This is a conscientious choice and so forth. So then it disappeared. Then you, 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 how do you explain uh, the, the loss of it? So I didn't respond to that. I don't think China is ready ideologically, but this is inevitable. We say, look, the Maoist legacy is, uh, uh, is no longer relevant at all. Uh, you mentioned actually in your books that um, the third wave of Confucianism is uh, important in the sense that it's actually the periphery is challenging the center. Um, so my question is, you know, we can see in the past in uh, Confucius' own time um, was indeed also in some way periphery challenging the center, <coughs> but the, the center, the state was actually very weak. The state was actually trying to use Confucianism as a way to legitimize itself and yet in turn, the Confucians were also able to constrain the, the emperor uh, using their moral and, and uh, moral standards and their uh, uh, understanding of the heaven kind of overseeing the, uh, the earth in some way, a trajectory of their own ideals uh, to, to constrain the emperor. But nowadays, we actually have a new kind of uh, uh, all sorts of other alternatives other than Confucianism as the ways to legitimize the, the power of the state. So when you don't really have, uh, we, when, when the state does not need Confucianism or, or other uh, moral um, alternatives to actually legitimize themselves, then uh, the periphery can only uh, persuade the state, but it's only through the, um, the power of the state to increase their own, own this is not what I understand the situation is. I think uh, no matter what, for the last 20 or 30 years, the state in China, the power of the state has been eroding very fast, both in terms of moral persuasion, in terms of administrative ability to do things. Now the state tries hard, the central state tries hard to negotiate with all these other, uh, other provincial governments. The state it, it works very hard to negotiate with the mass media. Uh, with the business community, with the academic community. The state increasingly plays the role of a negotiator. And they don't have real power in that sense. That, that, that's something uh, some people are deeply worried if the state is weak. I mean, the central government is weak, whereas if many of the local governments become very strong. You have a kind of a worse kind of feudal laws. They're very oppressive. You know, in traditional Confucian tradition, there's a rule of avoidance. If you come from Sanxi, you will never be, be a law or a, a ruler in Sanxi. You have to be signed somewhere else. But right now in China, the, the situation is very different. So my, my sense is that um, whether we, you call it Confucian or not, China needs to have a sense of direction. It needs to develop its own vision, its, its identity, cultural identity which hopefully is open, pluralistic, and self-reflexive. China doesn't have it. The, uh, um, what does it mean being Chinese, for example? Uh, if uh, Hong Kong, a person from Hong Kong says, I don't want to be Chinese, I want to be a Hong Kong person, how do you react to that? And, and of course, the case with Japan and all kinds of other issues. Right now, it's a very shallow nationalistic sentiment, mobilized for the wrong reason because there's no way. So you need a sense of direction, you need a sense of cultural identity, you need a sense, you know, you need a sense of awe, sense of feeling, sense of respect, sense of reverence for the whole, for the whole society. You, you cannot train a group of uh, some of the brilliant young people simply by arguing that power is the most important value. 
uh, more, more so than money, than knowledge, than wisdom. You, you just cannot do that. But right now, we're in a terrible shape. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I just, that's what I wanted to pick up the three of us discussing about this. The, the role of Confucianism and the peak of China as you know, Confucian kind of state. I'm a huge believer in Confucianism myself, but I always feel very pessimistic. But it seems like in China, the biggest problem, as you said, like we, we, there's a, a sense of direction. But the, now I think consensus is lost. There's no consensus. There is a, we had a very troubled 20th century with all those disputes and problems with the tradition. So those problems with it continue to be problems today. You know, like you said, like the new, the new left leftists. This is a very powerful group. I think a lot of people who can be here might identify with this, this trend. So, you know, with those different ideologies being placed, and uh, each of them like contesting for for supremacy or dominance, how could Confucianism become the the, the, the last one of them? You know, can can survive this? Of course, process? this is a question for Fukuyama. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to take oh, a no, I, crack yeah, at that? It's a big problem, right? <laughs> 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 um, my own position is this. Um, I always use the term Confucian traditions, not, not just one tradition. Uh, because as, as, as we know, uh, Korean Confucianism is different from, uh, say, Japanese Confucianism, Vietnamese Confucianism, and so forth. So. What is happening now is the need for the quest of a cultural identity. I think precisely because there's a loss of direction that has something to do with the total collapse of the Maoist uh, ideology of uh, class struggle and, and so forth. Right. So in this particular context, the kind of uh, consensus formation that is going to happen, you know, I think it's happening, Certainly not top down. There's no way that uh, Beijing is able to say, this is our ideology. There's no way now. And there's no way that uh, the party ideologue will be able to do that, uh, including those who are very much seasoned in the, in the Marxist rhetoric. So it's a negotiation. And this negotiation depends upon a format in which public reasoning is at least possible. I think it's happening. Right now, we don't have a very good mechanism for public reasoning. We have all kinds of ways of voicing our discontent you know, through the net and so forth. But I think it's emerging a public space for public debate uh, on some very, very important uh, uh, national issues. So then, um, you know, because the, the idea of public intellectual, the so-called is, uh, is really considered you know, highly politicized and uh, most people just don't want to be associated themselves with. However, if we take this notion about the intelligentsia uh, in the Russian sense very seriously, we have people in the government. They are basically responsible, they are well informed. We also have the same kind of people in many other uh, spheres of interest. M mass media to be sure, but government, um, academic community, even religion and so forth. So we need to hear those kind of voices in terms of horizontal communication. My sense is it's happening. One thing I felt very strange when I first uh, returned, you know, two years ago to Beijing, it's difficult to get a group of intellectuals together to discuss any issue because they're so much uh, overwhelmed by their own ideo ideological affiliation. I say, can the liberal be invited to a meeting, you know, at Beida, for example, together with the new left? There's, there's no way. The last time it did was at Harvard when I organized something. Only outside of China. I said, that's ridiculous. So I'm hopeful if horizontal communication is possible, then it is not that uh, we have a sense of direction, but we need to have a mechanism where the discussion of a sense of direction can take place. Uh, direction might not be oh, no, no, certainly not. Certainly not. It, uh, maybe Taoism, maybe Buddhism, maybe Christianity, but it uh, doesn't matter. But you need to have that kind of discussion. But the discussion will have to happen not in mainland China alone. See, my, my sense, uh, that's why I take the cultural China idea very seriously, uh, and also the periphery as the center, because I think the discussion will happen, uh, can happen in the Bay Area. You know, when Bai Xianyong can, with 600 people talking about 
uh, Republican Chinese history. It's a very important input. It could happen in the Bay. It could happen at uh, Oxford, for example. Recently, I was involved with LSD and Oxford. The discussion is just very heated. It can happen in um, Taiwan, in Hong Kong, many other places. And these voices, you know, f for example, it's very difficult to get into this question. For example, how do we deal with the question like Tibet? Can there be a public debate on, on this issue at all? In China, it's not possible. But it can be done in, uh, in the Bay Area, right? It can be done in Taiwan and other places, but it's not done because uh, the uh, Chinese intellectual tradition uh, has been so politicized. There's only one kind of discussion. Many other kind of discussions are, uh, are not possible. So that's our, pro uh, that's our problem. It's not the problem of Beijing alone. People acquire more wealth, they will rise up and challenge the authority. But um, if they did thrive in this, under this institution, under this system, um, aren't they incentivized to maintain the status quo? Are they, um, or it, it's intuitive to, to think that, oh, you know, middle class mm -hmm. not wanting to obey authority. So what, what how do you see that being Well, so it, it's very complicated because challenging authority does not necessarily mean demanding a change in the regime or, you know, wanting large structural change. So, you know, people <laughs> don't feel safe in China eating the food, you know, and they don't like this. And I think that, um, you know, as you acquire more wealth and education, your inclination to complain about that is just greater. Uh, and so that doesn't mean that you're demanding that the Communist Party step down and turn over, you know, control to a multi-party, you know, democracy. But it means you're going to you, know, you complain. And, and so I just think you see this all the time in, in, you know, the way that people have been reacting to, you know, bad government decisions in in uh, China. Now, the middle class thing, I think. Uh, it, it's very complicated because actually I think middle class people do not necessarily reject authoritarianism and support democracy. There's lots of cases of that in Latin America, you know, in Thailand right now, the middle class, you know, was pro-democratic in the 1990s. They've completely turned around and support the king and, and the army uh, uh, at the moment because they're too worried about the emergence of a populist, well, not the future emergence, but they've got this populist leader, Toxin, that's doing all of this redistribution that's destroying their, you know, wealth, and they don't like it. And so they're perfectly happy to support an authoritarian regime. And my impression actually is that if you polled most middle class Chinese and said, do you want multi-party democracy anytime soon, they'd all say no, you know, <coughs> for the same reasons that the Thai middle class doesn't want it. So, so I don't think there's any correspondence between just getting richer and wanting democracy. I just think, though, that it, it gives you a very different attitude towards uh, authority. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for clarifying. Let me, me just uh, short note here. Um, I, I, this is not, not an area that I've done any, uh, any research. Let's say we have 40,000 billionaire China. Eight million Chinese have dual citizenship. In other words, they have green cards or, or some kind of idea, maybe not, not just the States, but Canada and other places. So maybe you have three or four million people that could be considered as elite. And uh, the middle class in India, we have 200, uh, 200 million. In China, maybe only um, 20, I think it's smaller in India. Much, oh, smaller, yeah, but in China, much smaller. So we talk about this group of people, uh, including all the top leaders. Uh, they have relatives, they have children studying abroad. So they're no longer, their loyalty, if you talk about the loyalty to the kind of outmoded ideology, is non-existent. And most of, their, uh, most of them, uh, especially their, uh, you know, their wives and children, are deeply rooted in a different kind of religious consciousness. 
I think many of them are really, uh, many of the, the believe in Tibetan Buddhism mm. in, uh, or in, uh, in the popular Buddhism, uh, Christianity. So you have a very, very uh, vibrant, uh, religiously speaking, very vibrant community. The first thing China will have to do, it's very difficult, is to open that discussion. The discussion on religion, on basic values, things of that nature. But China is so frightened by anything, you know, like the Falun Gong and, and things of that. They, they just say, no, 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 any discussion will lead to disruption and maybe even disorder. My sense is that the regime should feel at least confident enough to open that discussion. The, the idea is if you don't do that, the change can be explosive. It's not just disruptive, it can be explosive. So you need to open it. And how to open it? At least at campuses, major universities, they should be able to talk about this. Uh, if you are fearful that Beida may not be the right place, let Tsinghua people do it first, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and no matter what, you, you need to have channels, people. Now the situation is, for anyone, if in Hong Kong you still know, uh, you know, of course in Bay Area you know everything, right? In Hong Kong you still know a lot. Once you move to Guangzhou, your understanding of the overall situation is uh, greatly compromised. Once you arrive in Beijing, now you suddenly realize you're in a place where information and disinformation you know, coexist in a way that it's difficult for you to have any kind of real judgment. So this is not the way to, to handle you know, uh, an emerging power. And there are just numerous, extremely sophisticated, extremely cosmopolitan people or consultants in the economic sphere. China, uh, uh, now the government, is benefit, has benefited from all these uh, input. And many of them are very, very, also very well seasoned in political affairs. But in terms of religion, in terms of culture, and many other areas, China is so poor right now. They ju it just don't have enough people that will be able to offer the proper advice to how to deal with the situation abroad. Well, my question is for Professor Fukuyama. I was struck by one observation you made about the West, and that was that um, you saw the problem in the West as having to do with the loosening of control. Did I understand that correctly? No. Okay. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I was trying to say is that I think that a successful modern regime involves uh, having a state that is strong but is constrained appropriately constrained. And I think that the entire Western tradition, uh, and especially the Anglo-Saxon tradition, has emphasized constraint to a point that it becomes dysfunctional. That uh, you, um, both through law and through um, you know, democracy exercised through legislatures, you and uh, it, it weakens the ability of states to come to collective decisions to engage in collective action and to make you know necessary decisions and so I think our budget deficit is a great case of this that you know this is not an unsolvable question other countries have you know dealt with our level of debt in the past but our system can't do it because we have so many checks and balances some of them built into the Constitution others that we've just created out of thin air uh, over the last couple of generations that you know, everything's deadlocked in, in Washington. So we've got too many checks and balances and not enough, you know, ability to uh, act cohesively. So that's what I think our particular problem is. Well, I think that's where we need Confucianism. Certain <laughs> politicians in America have no sense of shame. <laughs> right? You're supposed to know when to stop. You're supposed to have a sense of shame. Um, my own fear in the West, though, is that the the power of the state is increasing, and it's increasing through electronic surveillance, and then we're losing our liberties um, for that reason. And I won't go into detail, but I also teach in Australia. I'm an American originally, and the Australian politics is, is also very debased right now because it's essentially controlled by these so-called faceless men of the Labor Party who are in cahoots with the, the mining, mining interests. Kevin Rudd, the uh, prime minister, was pulled from power by his own party, and they're 
no explanation was ever offered to the public. It's not something that went through a vote. So I mean, yeah, I think increasingly we have less power in the West as individuals. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's just a feature of Westminster systems, but uh, actually compared to the United States, I think Australia is doing pretty well. Um, <laughs> it's doing well economically, but not in terms of rights. I mean, the big joke in Australia is when people get arrested, they say to the police, aren't you going to read me my rights? And the police respond, you've been watching too many American TV shows. I <laughs> 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 have two questions, uh, each for a uh, professor. So. From Professor Tube, so I actually uh, was here yesterday, and I'm um, like deeply like intrigued by your ideas of like how you would like uh, the uh, Confucian scholars or the intelligentsia as a whole to play as a mediator between the people and the state, or between the uh, desirable Western ideas and concepts uh, and the traditions of Confucian. So I'm wondering if practically this could be like possible in the modern era, because historically we know that, uh, as you said yesterday, in the book of Great Learning, uh, the social space of uh, Chinese society is actually very condensed and very depressed, because either uh, the Confucian uh, scholars or intellectuals, they play as a ritual role, uh, of ritual head of their family, or they play as an uh, integral part of, of the state. So, uh, when they're integ integrated to the society, uh, no, no, to the state, uh, they actually like, probably the state will sway to the legalist uh, direction. And actually, uh, the, like in Ming and Qing dynasty, actually uh, the state has more power than intelligentsia. They suppress what, it, what the intellectuals want to do and actually use the intellectuals as a means to conduct their own will. And or others like in uh, probably in Song Dynasty or before, the intelligentsia actually uh, try to e uh, execute their uh, Confucian ideals, but actually uh, the internal conflicts in the intelligentsia actually bring down the whole dynasty, the whole authority as a whole. So how would this be possible, like in the modern era, to prevent this kind of instance happen again, like to go into an, another uh, like cycle of this kind of phenomenon? So that's my question for you. And maybe a question for Professor Fukuyama? Yes, and then he, he will well, answer. Why don't you, why don't you yeah. take that one? OK. Uh, maybe um, I didn't present my case uh, persuasively yesterday. What I have in mind is uh, the situation in China now is so fluid. The um, the intention to have a very comprehensive mechanism of control is strong from the central government. But the actual situation is that uh, uh, the network of control is extremely porous. So the possibility of uh, individual and collective action in China today is tremendous. There's a, there's a great deal of room for, for uh, not manipulation, for uh, movement. Precisely because the, the state itself, uh, you know, the state, in, in general, of course, they is more powerful than society, unlike the situation in the United States. But I think there are many, many societal forces that emerged in China today that the state will have to negotiate with each one of them. So the, the idea is that if uh, people in many different spheres of interest share a general orientation what the state ought to, ought to perform through the process of public reasoning. I think the situation is changing. That's, that's, my, that, uh, that's my sense of uh, the, uh, the authentic possibility of a protest spirit. Now, uh, le let me re return to history just for a moment. In the Han Dynasty, there are two kinds of Confucians. One is Su Sun Tong, and Gong uh, Sun Hong, these are basically party functionaries. Their idea is to help the government to find ways to enhance its uh, influence, its power, its own self-interest. So these Confucians were considered Su Ru, 
vulgar Confucians, corrupt Confucians. There are so many of them all over the place. Then you have Dong Zhongshu. You have many, many other uh, Confucian scholars that turn out to be extremely powerful in shaping the political, uh, the, the uh, political culture of the Han Dynasty. Now, if you look at some of the very effective and powerful critics of the regime ever since Tiananmen, right? And you realize these are also very deeply rooted in the party structure. Uh, Li Xinzi may be one of the uh, one of the good examples, but uh, you know, uh, people like Wang Ruo Sui, who's the uh, uh, who's the chief editor of the People's Daily, and so forth. So these people actually articulate a kind of intellectual intellectual spirit, which I I think is absolutely critical for the modern transformation of China. about um, the fragmentation of the Chinese society and also the breaking down of family values. Um, how, does, how do you think Confucian, new, new Confucianism can function in China without the uh, extended family connections and understanding of the um, kind of handling down of Confucian values from one generation to another? Yeah, I would say uh, a kind of um, genetic reasons are to be differentiated from structural reason. Now, genetically, Confucianism has a lot to do with the agriculture-based economy, family-centered uh, social structure, a patrimonial uh, bureaucracy. But in fact, we look at the situation just in front of us. There's virtually no agriculture in Singapore, right? No agriculture in Taiwan, and the the, uh, the largest agriculture societies in Confucian were basically anti-Confucian. That's China. Now, family, there's so many ideas about what a family ought to be. But the question is, extended family as, as a social unit never really existed in China. It's an ideal, but never, you know, the anthropologists have showed us again and again that average size of Chinese family is always five, never beyond that. In terms, in terms of the overall situation. But you cannot bypass the family. That's the strength of the Confucian rhetoric. Right now, of course, we, we, see, um, we see the families. Uh, you, you just, uh, just one example is good enough. Reli uh, commitment to education is, to me, a kind of uh, commitment of a civil religion to provide the opportunity for my children or for my son, for my daughter, to be well educated. That commitment is uh, an existential commitment of a, of a kind of ultimate concern in China. That is deeply rooted in Confucian tradition. And that's how many of us uh, benefit from that. Um, um, I just have a maybe more practical and earthly questions. So just now, I think a lot of our questions have touched upon maybe class stratification and social uh, inequality um, and uh, the role of Confucian scholars as the mediator between the state and the people. So I'm just wondering, um, like as scholars or intellectuals, how can we maybe reach out to people to practice the idea of sympathy in a real way? Because I've, I've been working for an organization that helps adopted Chinese kids in the US and it's really like, ridiculous to know that even in the 21st century a lot of girls have, are still being abandoned are still being abandoned and adopted by American and Western parents and it's you know whenever I see these kids little kids girls especially running around like in four or five years old I think it's really a great privilege for us to be like sitting in a great institution and um, debating about these ideas so I'm just wondering like how do maybe two professors and all of us think that we can utilize that knowledge and that understanding to help people in a maybe more real world setting? I think first. that's for you too. <laughs> um, uh, let's, let's look at the situation in Taiwan. I think uh, by far the most uh, important contribution. Um, in this particular arena of enhancing people's feeling of sympathy and compassion 
comes from what we call the humanist Buddhism, Renjian Fo Yao, including uh, Xing Yun, Ci Ji Gong De Hui, and um, and Zhen Yan. So all these uh, all these Buddhist institutions are committed to what they call Confucian ethics. They're not teaching uh, they're not teaching uh, the people to leave their families, uh, to join the monasteries, to become monks, and so forth. They're not, they're not doing that at all. They're just teaching people to be basically decent, kind, and others. So, so this has been very successful. Then you do have a very powerful movement now in China from Christian evangelism, which is, all, again, uh, very much committed to social gospel, to helping people to be better. And I think many uh, religious traditions have been, you know, have played this kind of role. Your notion about the one child, as a result of one child policy, you know, this, this has uh, now generated a great deal of discussion. And I think uh, China probably will abandon the one child policy very soon. And even, even if China does it, uh, it's, a, it's really too late in terms of the workforce, in terms of aging, in terms of many, many other unintended negative consequences. So China will have to learn to manage this, this uh, uh, set of issues, uh, very, very difficult uh, issues, including uh, uh, caring for the old. Uh. It's getting late. Uh, let's thank two professors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>